Hello and welcome to The Road to Autonomy. I'm your host, Grayson Brulte. The Road to Autonomy is brought to you in part by Stantec Generation AV. Stantec Generation AV combines some of the most experienced AV experts in the industry with the resources of a global engineering firm. Stantec Generation AV provides education, consulting, assessment, and guidance to any industry interested in autonomous vehicles. Learn more at Stantec.com. Hello and welcome to The Road to Autonomy. I'm your host, Grayson Brulte. On today's episode, we're absolutely honored to welcome Matt McClellan, Vice President of Sustainability and Innovation, Covenant Logistics. Matt, welcome to the podcast. Thanks. Great to be with you virtually because last time you and I met, we were in Vegas at like this massive AV, I don't know, event party. What, what, was, what was that we were at? It was the Atonicast party. That was a that was a good time we were talking. Then we walked the floor and saw the the big giant caterpillar and the John Deere autonomous tractor. We were in autonomy land then. And just for clarity for your audience, that was the consumer electronics show. It was. It was. And I'll I'll be there next year and, and hopefully you'll be there. We'll see what really interesting new autonomy toys are rolled out as this business really commercializes and your business is sitting there, Covenant, you're commercializing, you're looking at ways to explore to integrate autonomy into your trucking solutions. Matt, you're sitting there, you speak to a lot of individuals, you go on one heck of awesome road trips that you post on your, your LinkedIn page. On those road trips, you have time to think. How are you currently thinking about long haul trucking as it relates to autonomy? You know, it's a great question because Covenant has the second largest expedited fleet in the country. So what that means is we've got about 850 team drivers that, you know, I guess it's not even really called slip seating if you never really get out of the truck, but, you know, we will drive for almost 17 hours a day. Typically it's coast to coast fruits and vegetables, expedited runs. So it's the, it's a business that we understand, right? Staying on the road for long periods of time in order to get things there as quickly as possible, maximizing the efficiency of that asset. And so when autonomy first, you know, came onto the scene, Grayson, you know, too simple was one of the first ones. And they, you know, the rest of them, Waymo and Kodiak and Aurora and the other ones started sort of popping up. And now we have, you know, Wabi and, and, a, and a few other ones that have reached out to me just recently. You know, we figured that even though there were a lot of problems that's, that were going to need to be solved, a lot of problems, right? I mean, everything from refueling and, what happens if you get pulled over and break down and, and, and the, the last mile, all those types of problems. We knew that those were almost as complicated, if not more complicated than the technology itself. But we figured that we needed to have a seat at the table because autonomy was going to be a way to potentially augment our business. And so we've been involved from the very beginning. That's a very positive thing. Before we go into that, you mentioned fruits and vegetables. There's a growing trend that's only accelerating of farm to table restaurants, farm to table at your grocery store, are you seeing a big movement in your business based on the farm to table movement? Well, you know, farm to table is more local, you know, kind of a, a local thing. So, you know, farm to table within maybe 20, 30, 50 miles of where you live. So, no, we haven't, at least not related to that. It's mostly moving mass quantities of fruits and vegetables as quickly as possible from, you know, the Salinas, California area, which is where a lot of that stuff is grown to large cities like New York and Chicago, Miami, places like that. So yeah, farm to table movement, which my wife, who's a physician and I, she, well, not me, but she's a physician. She's very much in favor of, in fact, talks to her patients about belonging to local vegetable co-ops and things like that so that you're eating local as well. It's healthy. It's, it's really healthy for you. It's, it's healthy that you, you have a seat at the table. Not only do you have a seat at the table autonomy, Matt, you go on long haul rides. You post this whole journey when you went with a professional covenant driver. You're eating at rest stops, sleeping there, showering there. What did you learn from that journey? What were some of your key takeaways? Farm to table was not a part of that experience. I can tell you that. <laughs> eating healthy and some of those things were not a part of that. You know, Grayson, if you're in the industry, and when I say you, I don't, well, well, you would be welcome. I'd love to kind of help hook you up on an experience like that if you were ever interested. But for your listening audience, if you're in trucking, you need to do a ride along with a driver, especially if you're an executive and you're making decisions on behalf of the great men and women out there driving trucks, delivering freight, because riding in a truck, and in my case, four days on the road, um, three nights in the cab, in a bunker, in a bunk, right? So it wasn't, we weren't sharing a bed, we were in the bunk. 
it gives you more context and experience into that whole kind of analogy of walk a mile in somebody else's shoes. I learned about what drivers think of every issue on the planet, some of which I wanted to know and others that I didn't. I learned about what it's like to eat and shower at a restaurant, at a rest stop, which you pointed out. I learned what it's like to pull up to a dock and make a delivery, ask to use the restroom and be told I had to go use a porta john out behind the building. I have walked into truck stops and sort of been discounted by other travelers, you know, consumers that are in there just look at me like I fell off a turnip truck. It was a great experience. And, you know, you and I could do an entire podcast, you know, about what that was like. I think probably my biggest takeaway, impossible to eat healthy on the road and small problems for drivers or or small problems for people like you and me are really, really, really big problems for drivers. Just as an example of that would be, I have something wrong with my paycheck I send an email to HR and I forget about it. I set a reminder to sort of look it back up if they haven't replied in a couple of days. For a driver, you just have nothing else to think about, right? Because you're just driving and the minutia of life just continues to build up. And some of these things that we consider to be small issues or big issues. And so one of the things I took back to our leadership, Grayson, was that we need to make sure that we're staying on top of everything, no matter how insignificant we feel like it is, because to our driver's it's a big deal. Does that make sense? Makes a lot of sense. The, the, the sad, unfortunate incident of the, of the professional driver that had to use the restroom. Let the gentleman use no, the that restroom. Was me. That was oh. me. <laughs> well, let, let Matt use the restroom. There you go. I mean, let's go. It's the, the professional drivers. They are the backbone of the economy, and they need to be paid more respect because if it's not with the professional drivers, you don't have your washer machine. You don't have your vegetables. You don't have your meat. You don't have a lot of things. Your iron. All things that go into your house, if you bought it, it came on a truck because it brought it. When you're going through this journey, you have a lot of time to think of deep reflections. Was there any impacts or big takeaways that you took away from that as it relates to autonomy? How autonomy can improve the industry or just changes that autonomy can bring that are positive to the industry that you experienced firsthand? Yeah, you know, there's a company, and I think you've had some of these folks on your podcast in the past, Grayson, the the Plus AI. Have you had that? Have you? I know you've ridden in that truck because I think you and I talked about it once. But that's it's not really autonomy, but it's like level two on steroids, right? It is technology in the truck that helps with everything from lane key to nudging to you know the, the truck is making some decisions, but not as many as, you know, with the full on, you know, autonomous truck that, you know, with a driver wouldn't be in it. You know, there's things like that, that you could invest in today that would probably take some of the driver fatigue out of the equation. And as I was driving down the road with the driver, I was asking him questions based on my plus AI experience. Like, do you think that these types of enhancements, technology enhancements to, you know, to the vehicle would make your job easier or, you know, because I'm in the seat, and I'm driving, whether or not it's making my job a little bit easier or not, I'm still in the seat and it doesn't really matter. And and I felt like it would be a big plus. The driver felt like, yeah, he could see a benefit, how much of a benefit he really wasn't able to, to say unless he had actually experienced it for himself. One thing it did really teach me is that, you know, and granted, we were on some long haul runs, right? We were on the road for like five and six hours at a time in parts of the country where there wasn't a lot of traffic. And the whole time I'm wearing my autonomous hat, right, because it's one of the roles that I have in the company is to think about that, is it really is the simplest thing to do on the road is to drive in a straight line and to get off only when you need to, which is to refuel or use the restroom. And of course, if you're in an autonomous truck, you don't have to use the restroom, then go until I've got 20% of fuel left in the tank and then sort of, you know, pull over somewhere to fill up. It's a great application for it, as you know, better than I do, Grayson, because I think you've been at this longer than I have. There's still a lot of problems to solve, but I do feel like we're going to get there one day, and I do feel like there's a place for it. There's a lot of problems to solve, but as an industry, I'm very proud we're getting there. The industry is entering the phase of commercialization. I'm not going to put a a timeline. There are uh, companies that made public statements for commercializing in in 2024. Whether they stay to those timelines or not, I'm not going to to judge, but it's a very big milestone for where this in- industry is going. You mentioned earlier, you have the seat at the table. One of those seats tables is with Aurora, with, with, with Kurt Sermson and Sterling Anderson. 
and you announced in May 2022 that you're going to explore an integration of the Aurora Horizon for our listeners that are not sure what that is. That's their virtual driver into Covenant operations. That was a year ago. How is that partnership going? We meet every week and we just sort of talk through um, updates as to what they're doing. It's not just the truck, right? Because there's a lot of problems to solve. There's, you know, obviously making the truck do what it was designed to do, but there's all of the 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 launch procedures, the receiving procedures, you know, discussions about different ideas related to drop yards and how that's going to work. And, you know, again, you and I could sort of talk for a, an entire episode just about a, how that may or may not work. And I almost think that there's not going to be any one solution. It's going to be a fleet to fleet solution for a smaller trucking company like Covenant with, you know, 25, 2700 trucks. It's going to be a much different solution than probably somebody like Schneider that has 10,000 trucks and terminal yards very close to the interstate throughout the United States. You know, they may even be able to solve that problem on their own. But for for companies like us that don't have quite the assets and the real estate that they do, it'll probably be a lot more difficult. So, you know, we meet every week. Right now, we're trying to find a pilot um, in the Texas area uh, where we can work together to start delivering freight. And building experience, one of the things that I've been working on is a list of KPIs of things that we're interested in knowing more about. How many disengagements did you have? How many times did you pass a vehicle? How many times did you step on the brakes? How many times was there a hard brake? How many, t- you know, there's so there's all these sort of things that we're kind of building out. And all of a sudden, a week turns into a month, it turns in, and then all of a sudden, a year has gone by. And you still don't have autonomy in play yet because it's just such a long road, right? Which is why your podcast appropriately is called The Road to Autonomy. Aurora will give you different dates as to when that technology is going to be ready than, say, Torque or one of the other players. So I think they each have their own timelines, but they all have some common problems to solve. And that's one of the reasons I like getting together at the event that you and I were at, where I can talk with the providers, but also talk with my peers, my competitors, right? At other companies like, man, how are you going to deal with this? Because I have no idea how I'm going to deal with it. I love those conversations, right? They're learning environments. That's what they are. That's the best thing about the conferences that we attend and the events we go to. I don't necessarily go for the speakers. I just go to to catch up with, with industry colleagues and friends and learn and see what you're uncovering there. As it relates to launch procedures, I've been thinking a lot about this and looking at the the labor issue that we're currently facing as a global economy, with especially with the IMF downgrade report today. Do we get to a point where there's a launch procedure standards where Aurora, Torque, Too Simple, Waymo all agree on a standard where there's a trained technician that goes through a vocational school or through SAE, for example, and gets certified on how to launch an autonomous vehicle as for the, the depots. You mentioned the Schneiders, but you also have the Prologes that own large real estate, so the CBREs. Does there become a standard there where this technician is certified to, to work on Aurora, Torque, Waymo, whoever it might be? Oh, there's got to be, right? Because I think that ultimately that launch is going to be, we're not always going to have the luxury of being one of our own employees. And so I think that that is one of the areas they're all going to work on together to come up with a common procedure. You know, think about it. Everything else in life, you know, I've got a friend that's an airline pilot and he's actually worked for two different airlines. And he was telling me about what the walk around procedure is like when they before they take off. And he said that uh, I think Delta was he used he's at Delta now, but he was at Southwest. And he said the way that works is exactly the same. So, listen, the launch procedure isn't rocket science. There's no reason why it shouldn't be consistent. I'm an advocate for that. It's interesting you bring that up because that's actually something that came up as a discussion point recently. We need to keep a lot of this stuff as ubiquitous as possible. That's something I think we can all definitely agree on. Fantastic, because it's going to allow us to scale. The next issue as an industry for the trucking side of the atomic that we're going to have to agree on is is fuel. There's the debate around battery electric, diesel, renewable diesel. Does one form of the fuel start to emerge as another? The, The reason I'm leaning towards renewable diesel or hydrogen, for that matter of fact, is it's the range. Your trucks, you drive a very long range. You drive thousands of miles. Yeah, a tank of gas in a 250-gallon tank, you know, will get you 1,000 miles or more. A 200-gallon tank will get you 1,000 miles, right? You're certainly not going to get that from electric. You're certainly not going to get that from CNG. You're certainly not going to get that through um, hydrogen. So, right, we're here. So, here we are with diesel. Diesel and the value proposition of autonomy is – Asset utilization, making that truck stay on the road to cover the most miles possible as efficiently as possible. 
really the expedited nature of it is probably the biggest value proposition. So, you know, for better, or for worse, Grayson, diesel is the way to make that happen. So then it comes down to, well, is that regular straight number two, or is it some flavor of biodiesel? You know, you hear things about everything from B5 all the way to B100, which is, I don't really get that, but B100 apparently is something that is a thing. And then, of course, you bring up renewable diesel, which I feel like that's where the conversation is pivoting to, which I'm kind of excited about because I'm really bullish on on renewable diesel. You know, I'll just kind of briefly go into that and kind of let you guide me down how the how you think we should talk about this, because there's a lot of different ways we could go about it. The problem with renewable diesel is availability. And so if you're going coast to coast and your goal is to use renewable diesel because you know, the big advantage to that is it makes the engine run cleaner, 60%, 70% fewer greenhouse gas emissions from the tailpipe. It has less soot. And from the driver's perspective, it's just sort of less kind of particulate matter and things floating around in the air can stick into your clothes and your body. So at the end of the day, it's a beautiful drop in fuel. It'd be great if we could use it in the autonomy world, but you know, hey, we're going to use it wherever we can get it, whether it's an autonomous truck or not. I'm going to add some Economic context to renewable diesel. Production of renewable diesels hit 5 million gallons a day for the first time in January, according to the United States Energy Information Administration. That's really impressive. But I want to add some some more context here. Annual production of renewable diesel tripled between 2019 and 2022 to 1.49 billion gallons a year. And it's not done yet. It's projected to grow to 3.34 billion gallons in 2024. All signs are, are pointing to to a trend here. But on, while there's a trend, do we have the fueling infrastructure? Do we have to retrofit the traditional diesel infrastructure for renewable diesel? Or, or what does that look like? Because there's a, clearly a trend here. So I'll start out by saying this. At some point, I know your your podcast is called Road to Autonomy, but if you really want to get the, 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 the nuanced explanation of renewable diesel, there's this guy named Keith Wilson who owns a 45-truck fleet up in uh, outside of Portland, Oregon who, in, in my opinion, is the renewable diesel cheerleader advocate, the guy that knows more about it than anyone else I've ever met. I came across him at the ACT Expo a couple of years ago. He's been using it exclusively in his fleet for the last year and a half. And I could spend a bunch of time going through all of the things that have been anecdotally and scientifically proven to be beneficial to the way his maintenance works, to how they don't replace fuel injectors, how their their oil is running better. I mean, they, they anyway, I could get on a rabbit trail with that. But Keith Wilson, remember then that name, Titan Freight Systems. You know, the problem with renewable is availability at scale, right? I mean, I talked to Daimler a few weeks ago when I was out there. They had some of their engine people in for this big event that we're talking about ESG and battery electric and autonomous. And at one of the breakout sessions, I started talking to one of the engine guys about his opinion on renewable diesel. And he said, well, you got the, you know, you got the memo, didn't you? And I said, which memo is that? We get a lot of memos from Daimler. He says, we actually prefer you to use it. It makes the engine run cleaner. You know, there's, you know, kind of went through all these different things. So at a molecular level, renewable diesel is identical to regular diesel, to regular straight number two. It's just better for the engine in every way. And of course, then you get the you know, the, the lower greenhouse gas emission. So the problem with renewables availability and feedstock and spinning up refineries or converting refineries from biodiesel to renewable diesel to kind of close the loop on this and kind of answer a question that you started to ask, there's no retrofitting involved. You could dump renewable diesel in a tank with number two and it's going to be better. It's not going to be worse and it's not going to mess anything up. You can mix and match inside of a tank. You don't have to do any retrofit to the truck. It's the perfect what's called drop-in fuel, and it's the perfect bridge to zero emissions. You know, it's a solution available today that will get us to a much better place than where we are. And you don't have to do anything except maybe pay a little bit higher price at the pump. But I think that's going to come down over time. The prices at the pump are high. S and P Global Commodity Insights they model that they lose at three eighty eight a gallon. Versus traditional diesel. So that has to come down. Right now, it's subsidized by government incentives, but there's a presidential election. There's a a divided Congress. There's geopolitical issues. If the subsidies go away, how are we going to get the price down? Is that just bringing more barrels of renewable diesel onto the market? We're seeing that 
with Exxon Mobil through their their affiliate, let's say wholly owned Imperial Oils, projected to deliver twenty thousand barrels a day of renewable diesel at their Stratacoma refinery in Canada by twenty twenty five. The important part of this is that output could reduce CO two emissions by three million tons a year. I repeat, three million tons a year as compared to con- conventional fuels. That's a very positive step. One, this gets no coverage, and two, how are we going to figure out the economics where the margins in trucking are, are very slim, to say the least? How do we make this economically viable? Because this is a very good, if you want to call it, transition path. Yeah, so that's like 18 questions in one, you know, one statement. And so I think the one I want to choose to answer first is that I would probably disagree with you, Grayson, as much as I agree with you on almost everything else, including that piece of art hanging behind you, which I know your listeners can't see, but since you and I have a video feed, I love whatever that is behind your, to the, to your right, to my left. But one of the things I don't agree with you on is that statistic, right? I, it's, it's more expensive, but by a factor of 359, I, that's just not right. The numbers that I'm seeing show that depending on what manufacturer creates it, that distills it, or I don't know, cooks it, whatever you want to call it, you know, it's more in the the pennies than it is in the dollars, but it is different. Now, I just testified in front of the Oregon State Legislature about, in fact, this guy, Keith Wilson, was the sponsor of a bill. It's called SB 803. In the state of Oregon, what he and others want to do is to make it requirement for the only diesel product sold at the pump in the state of Oregon to be renewable diesel. His argument is that from an environmental perspective, it's better. From an engine performance perspective, just in terms of maintenance, it's going to be much better. But they're convinced, based on the data that they're seeing, that there's plenty of supply available at the places that they've identified. To And we've got to remember, Oregon's probably, from a population perspective, one of the smaller states in the union. So it's not like California, right? So they believe the supply is going to be there, and they believe that the cost of diesel at the pump is going to be on par, or renewable diesel is going to be on par with regular diesel. Otherwise, you couldn't get John and Jane Doe driving their diesel Ford F-150. You know, like, why would they want to go about that if they're going to be paying pennies or, 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 or even dollars more for this product that, that arguably is going to be better for the environment? So it's going to be a, a long haul. There was another couple of things in there in your question that I think deserves addressing that, you know, it's it's a bridge, right? Renewable diesel is a bridge to zero emission vehicles. But just for the sake of conversation, right, let's say that hydrogen and battery electric and the flux capacitor or whatever else people are coming up with are a long ways off. I'd be really happy using renewable diesel for the indefinite future you know, for the next 20 years, it may not get us to zero emission, but it gets us onto a lot better place than we are now. So if we can use this nasty feedstock of animal fats and wood chips and all the things that go into renewable diesel, get rid of that in a way that is sort of better for landfills, not rely as much on foreign oil and, and drilling as we do today in order to power our diesel vehicles and generators and trucks and things like that then I just say this is one of the best things on the market right now for the sustainability movement. Well, wow, what are your thoughts? We're not reliant on China. It, to me, renewable diesel should be a well, national Russia, security probably, issue. Example. Well, because China controls the, the minerals, the refining of the, the of the minerals. Buffett gave an interview in the in the Nikkei today in Tokyo saying he sold out a Taiwan semi to the geopolitical issues. We saw uh, Macron, president of France, is telling everybody to, to butt out of Taiwan. Okay, so there, this is a hornet's nest that's about to get kicked and if china decides and and they have been very bold statements through their state-owned media to cut off our supply to refining access for batteries okay well you got a problem there you're starting if you look let's go this one step deeper look at tesla they've got the deal with catl largest battery manufacturer in the world oh they're building a battery factory in shanghai they're doing let's call it the the tim cook playbook appeasing china tim cook has done a masterful job of scaling apple in china whether right or wrong and different political not giving opinion on that but from a business strategic standpoint he's done very well elon musk is following the same playbook there but then you have other companies out out there that are more red white and blue that they could potentially get cut off and here we are with renewable diesel we canada is an ally it's not hard to get it we can manufacture renewable diesel here in america why is it not being treated as a national security issue? Because the, the, the political consequences of something going wrong are astronomical and they're only growing by the day. You know, I agree with you 100%. And I'll add one more thing to it. Now, 
I know that I, I would never get into the politics of left and right on a podcast because half your listeners are going to feel one way and the other half are going to feel another. But I can tell you, and 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 I don't think I would be wrong about this, is that one side of this argument, right, probably more of the left side of the argument, doesn't like renewable diesel because they think we should just skip past that and go straight to throwing all of our resources, government investment, anything that would be spent propping up something that's temporary, they just want to use that to go straight to figuring out zero emissions. And so I think while I sort of agree with that, you know, it's kind of what I feel like the move Gavin Newsom's doing in California by, you know, 2035, all cars are going to be, you know, battery electric, or at least not petroleum based, with there out being a roadmap on how that's going to happen. He's kind of thrown down the gauntlet. I admire him for that. But at the end of the day, we got to have a bridge and renewable diesel is a great bridge. And I got into a debate with a guy at this Oregon legislature thing where he felt like, renewable diesel was cheating and that, you know, it had marginal benefits and really where we needed to be spending our money was the development of whatever it was that was going to take us to true zero emissions. And so I guess that's where the right and the left would disagree. I think one side thinks a bridge is part of the solution. The other side would argue that we just need to spend all of our money going straight for the Holy Grail. I like bridges. It's kind of like if you want to lose weight, you know, I mean, if you want to run a marathon, you don't just go out and run a marathon. You start with a, a 5K, then a 10K, then a 15K, and you kind of work your way up to it. It's just sort of historically the way that a lot of things happen. Even when you look at things like, I know it's a rabbit trail, you look at carbon emissions in the state of California, you know, it's a 2024 through 2030 plan, right? You sort of gradually scale up over time. You just don't go straight into the finished product. There's just too much involved along the way. And I think renewable diesel is a great solution. And so I think with, yeah, I just think that's a great, it, it's a great solution. If you look at it from the passenger car side, hybrid, Toyota with the Prius and the whole movement of hybrid, that was a really great stepping stone to an, an all battery electric vehicle. Battery electric vehicles today are selling the way they do, then I give sole credit to Elon Musk. Everybody, the world's divided on him, but that's not the point here that I'm trying to make. The point is he built the charging infrastructure first, and that allowed Tesla to sell the vehicles. If Tesla didn't own and operate their own charging network, I truly believe that we're not having a conversation about Tesla today. And if you look at it from a long haul standpoint, we don't have the charging infrastructure yet. You have Pilot Flying J that's made an announcement with uh, Volvo to, to, to look into it, but yet we don't have it there. You speak to colleagues of yours in the industry, they say, even if we want it, we have to wait six months, a year, sometimes 18 months of utility to, to bring the energy in. So let's just say that's two years right there. And then we have the weight issue. So if you're going to haul Coca-Cola or for, for the individuals like Pepsi, you're going to haul Pepsi. There's a lot of weight there. The battery has weight there. We have all those issues that have to be overcome. So let's add another two years. So you got, let's say, a four to six year transition window Matt, your spot on that allows renewable diesel to fit in that four to six year transition window while reducing carbon emissions as you work towards, in your words, the holy grail. Yeah. Well, and let me throw one other curveball. And I know that you and I generally agreed on what we were going to talk about before the, the event, but let me throw one more curveball at you that is very much in that renewable diesel bridge camp. I'm sure because you're one of the most connected guys I know, you've heard of Remora and what Paul Gross and his team are doing with this direct carbon capture device that mounts to the back of a truck. You familiar with Remora? Yep. So just for your listeners that may not be, there's a small company that's very, very well funded and financially backed through, through private equity and other investments from carriers to mount this giant device under the back on the frame rails, the back of a class eight truck. It taps directly into the exhaust system it absorbs up to 80 to 90% of the carbon that comes out of the tailpipe. There might be some particulate matter and some other NOx that might be absorbed in there as well. We're not really sure, but the CO2 is kind of where the value proposition is. It stores it in a liquid form on the truck. When the truck hits about 500, 600 miles, the tank has to be unloaded into a collection tank, and then it fills back up with diesel and it hits the road again. The carbon then collects in that offloaded tank, and then they sell the carbon as a raw material to concrete and steel manufacturers. And so here we are, we're using this bridge technology, right, called direct carbon capture to capture exhaust out of the tailpipe, convert it to carbon or, or capture the carbon out, convert it to a form that's actually usable in something that we currently mine out of the earth today as a raw material and concrete. 
and we have a revenue source because they're able to sell it that offsets the cost of this very expensive investment, this very expensive device that goes on the back of a truck. The thing weighs fully loaded with carbon, 6,000 pounds, which takes away some of the weight that you can potentially pull in the trailer, you know, because that's what we're doing is we're hauling, you know, goods and ser- we're hauling goods across the country. So again, Remora, like renewable diesel is a bridge to help us get to a better place. And so I'm all about bridges. The North American Council for Freight Efficiency calls it the messy middle, right? This area today where we're at diesel, zero emissions is the holy grail. Everything in the in the middle is called the messy middle. And that's kind of where we are right now. And so I'm just a big fan of bridge technologies right now. Um, Grayson, I mean, you're probably seeing a lot of the same things because I run into you at some of these conferences. There's some great things on the horizon. And fortunately, my job is to wake up every day to read some of the things, same things that you do, and to bring the things that make the most sense to the attention of our leadership. The bottom line with bridge technology, it's a wonderful step forward. I repeat, it's a wonderful step forward. While we might disagree over the ec- economics, the S&P Global Commodity Insights numbers as it relates to renewable diesel, the bottom line is we're, we're moving in the right direction. The bottom line is th- there's not an ROI there yet today from a, a pure economic, put my CFO hat on here for a moment. But there is the social return on investment. What are your thoughts on that social return? Yeah, you know, that's interesting. I did a presentation. Actually, it's funny that you mentioned that. The CFO for a company called Nussbaum Transportation, they're one of our competitors, but a peer, as I like to say, because there's plenty of freight. We did a presentation at, I think, ATA a few years ago about social ROI versus financial ROI. So the idea is that when you are making an investment in an asset that's going to go on your truck, you have to decide whether or not the cost of that is going to pay for itself over time, or ideally, if you're going to save money over time. So you throw all that stuff into a spreadsheet and you know you get your ROI and you make your decision, do I invest in this thing or not? Well, that kind of used to be I guess it still is the biggest way that we make decisions. But as you point out, this social ROI, these in these other benefits that come from that decision, like how do you put value on it? I'll give you a great example. Electric APUs. Okay. You and I may have talked about this before. They're around nine grand a piece installed. They mount onto the truck. They charge up during the day and they allow the driver to enjoy the benefits of uh, HVAC and you know, all the electrical power that they need at night when they're resting, you know, whether it's a CPAC machine or a refrigerator or whatever it is that they run, Xbox machine and the case of my driver and the ride along that we did. So you can turn the engine off. And so you have this tremendous fuel savings, but all over time, but also carbon savings, right? But there's no place in my CFO's ROI model to put carbon savings because there's no dollar value necessarily attached to that. But you also, but you have to consider that when you're looking at the at this investment. Something else you have to consider is that the driver sleeps better at night. The driver likes it better. Maybe that is a driver retention sort of benefit, or maybe a better rested driver is a safer driver. And you could say that you know maybe the driver's safer, and so I avoided a multi million dollar accident because I was paying better attention. You know, you can't really put dollar values on these things, but it's what I call the social ROI. And so I think that as as leaders, as a lot of your listeners are making decisions about how to look at alternative technologies, alternative fuels, autonomous vehicles, you know, you have to look at some of these social benefits, these carbon saving benefits that traditionally have not gone into a financial model. While you look at those, do those costs get passed on or do do you eat those costs? Ooh, how many shippers listen to your podcast? (laughs) You'd be surprised. Well, so that is always an interesting debate, right? I mean, I think, and I'm going to speak about this at ACT Expo. There's going to be somebody from Microsoft on the shipper side, myself, and one of my colleagues and competitors named Patrick Watt from Penske. We're going to be on a panel together. and We're going to talk about that very question, Grace. And we're going to talk about the green premium, right? The investments that carriers are expected to make by shippers that have ESG goals and objectives, you know, most specifically through their scope three reduction. And for those more expensive green premium solutions, how do we pass that cost on, right? And if we do try to pass it on, is a shipper going to pay it? Traditionally, the answer to that has been no, they're not interested, but we're just starting to see shippers like Microsoft, like Nike, 
like Starbucks, they're willing to pay a green premium. They're willing to really sit down with the carriers, look at what those solutions are, measure what the carbon savings are, and say, yes, we are willing to invest with you to, for, for, I guess we just call it a green premium. But there are also a lot of people that will say, no, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus. But there's some very large shippers out there with very aggressive ESG initiatives that are not willing to pay more than what I call a diesel rate. So it's a challenge, you know, and I think your more progressive, thoughtful shippers are starting to realize their sustainability people and their procurement people are starting to spend more time together and realize that greener solutions are not always the cheapest solutions. How much of the green premium is brand? If you order a pair of Nike sneakers, they have the the carbon free shipping on the box. They're very proud of it. It's a very dark letters where it's, it stands out. How much does that become a premium from a marketing standpoint? So we don't do work with Nike, so I don't really know specifically the answer to that. But I can tell you that in this business, the optics of some of this stuff is a big deal. And I'm a fan of it, right? Just like, you know, I pick on Gavin Newsom a lot, but I think he's trying to sort of make a point. He's trying to throw the gauntlet down. He's trying to bring awareness to something that I think the general consumers of the world need to be more aware of. And so I think that a lot of companies, ultimately, they want to cut carbon, but they're also looking for some big wins and for some good stories that they can tell. And if some of those stories really resonate well, then those are things that they may invest more in. Let's say you're a a shipper and you have a million dollars to spend on a green premium. And you can do that through using a carrier that's more thoughtful about carbon reduction, or you could use that in the procurement of raw materials in the, the, you know, whatever it is you need to manufacture. You look at the two carbon savings, so it's two different decisions, and you may get more bang for your buck investing in procuring your raw materials from a place that's got more sustainable sort of creation of whatever it is that you're buying. And so you're going to get a better carbon savings there than you will with transportation spend, you know, because there's just not a lot diesel driving trucks are able to do right now. It's a challenge. It's a question that I think I'm starting to sit down more with the chief sustainability officer types at our shippers and, and, and talk through what some of this means. Does the green premium open the door for autonomy since autonomy will be cheaper to move it where you can have autonomy plus the the green premium, and now you've kind of got that package of the future? I am still working out, we are still working out if that autonomy is a more affordable solution. Because it's interesting, it depends on how you measure it. You know, ultimately in our business, everything gets down to cost per mile, right? So really it's about asset utilization. So I can drive that truck a little bit slower because I've got more time to get there in an autonomous mode. If I've got more time to get there, I can drive slower and pick up a mile per gallon increase because the air resistance at 62 is better than it is at 68. There's a couple of percentage points of efficiency there. The truck making better decisions on acceleration, deceleration, you know, there's a little bit there. So ultimately, those numbers add up to about 8 to 12% operating efficiency increase on that truck. And I can also run that truck longer. I'm not ignoring error codes. You know, there's all kinds of things that go into the value proposition of operating an autonomous truck more affordably. Those numbers right now in the early stages of autonomy are pretty tight. It's hard to make a value proposition to a customer. Like we need to do an autonomous run in order to save you money. It's coming. I just don't think that's where we're going to start with. I think autonomous is going to be more about an expedited potentially safer way to deliver goods. Eventually, once we have driver out and once we have more miles under the road, is it going to be a cheaper option? Sure. By a factor of what? I don't know. Maybe you've got some insights into that. What do you think? I don't know. I mean, you see numbers as as much as 30%, but I don't have any concrete financial data to give you a really good economic opinion. What I do have opinion on is is marketing. I could see if you get a very progressive, forward-looking brand that wants to go in all into autonomy, very futuristic brand saying, your Xbox, let's use Xbox, for example, since you was in that truck. Xbox was delivered with an autonomous truck. Welcome to the future. Enjoy your Xbox. Something like that. That becomes really, really clever and ties right into a marketing campaign for a forward-looking company that's selling you a piece of technology. You know, here's the interesting thing. I, I, I got up on a stage the other day to give a presentation in front of like a thousand people, right? And the topic was about sustainability and trucking and supply chain logistics. And 
I was trying to think of a creative way that wasn't a joke to start out my presentation. So I stood up, I looked at everybody, I kind of did some dramatic movements, looked at somebody in the front row, I picked them out and I said, you know what, in order for you to be here, something had to die. And there's sort of, I don't know if there was a collective gasp, but this person I was picking on, their sort of eyes, their eyes got big. They're like, what are you talking about? Well, leather in your shoes, food that you ate for breakfast, you know, the sausage biscuit, you know, whatever, and the, the animal. You know, we all as consumers forget about the impact we have on the planet and the choices that we make. Everything from what we wear to what we eat to how much we drive, basically to how we choose to live, right? And so it's easy to blame Exxon and BP and, you know, big bad corporations for they're the ones ruining the planet, not us. But at the end of the day, we forget that we're the ones and the choices that we make are the ones that keep these companies in business. If if we weren't driving cars, BP wouldn't be refining dinosaur remains, right? And so at the end of the day, to your question, consumers should be paying attention to it. And consumers should be shopping with their dollars to the extent that they can, right? It could be that somebody is in a financial situation and they can't afford to to purchase the more, the greener solution. You know, maybe it's a dollar more, maybe it's a penny more, whatever it is, it's just not possible, which is where regulation kind of comes into play. And that kind of gets into a larger conversation about, you know, because already, you know, you could argue that taxes on cigarettes or fuel or things like that are designed to encourage or discourage certain types of behavior. So I think it, it's it's important that as consumers like you and me and your listeners, you know, that we do think about these things. We do shop with our dollars. Maybe we look for companies that truly are doing sustainable things, whether it's what you pointed out with Nike and the way shoes are moved or find your favorite brand, read their ESG report. Starbucks has a great ESG report. Target, Walmart have great ESG reports. Hershey's, whose ESG report I actually have on my desk, they are doing some really interesting things with ethical sourcing of raw materials. Find your favorite brand, learn more about what they're doing on the environmental side of the way that they do their business, and start making some of your decisions based on that. Well said. Ethical sourcing is going to become a major, major trend. You mentioned it there with the cocoa beans and the various different and the confectionery that goes into chocolate, you're seeing it on luxury goods as well. Consumers care. And then you have, I use a term with you, consumer activism, that consumers are not only voting with their pocketbook, they're getting pr- pretty vocal when they don't like something. And companies that are, their values, they're embracing and, and driving their stock prices over it's up. And so it's going to be very interesting to see. But the bottom line is it's going to come down to consumer choice. Your customers in the future will have the option whether they want to put it on an autonomous truck or a truck driven by professional drivers. That's that's their choice depending on where they are with their budgets and where they are with their corporate messaging and, and what their customers ultimately end up caring about. Autonomy is coming. So where are you on that journey? Great question. We've partnered with um, Torque and Aurora. These are the two companies that I could make an argument that they're the best ones of the ones we evaluated. But I think I love the folks at Kodiak. I love the folks at Waymo. I love the folks at Wabi. One of the Wabi executives lives up the street from me. You know, Dustin Kale. We spend time together. Obviously, I love the folks at Torque and I love the folks at Aurora, you know, because I think that it's going to take a collective effort in order to move this to the next spot. So we felt most comfortable with Torque and Aurora for reasons that we won't really go into because probably not relevant to this particular podcast. But we feel like both of them are strong companies. We feel like all of them are strong companies, even Embark, who unfortunately is no longer with us, but they had a very strong leadership team and impressive technology. And so, you know, where we are with this is we're looking to do a pilot with a customer right now that's interested in doing it with us. You know, the pilot would involve a driver being in the cab and, you know, because there's no driver out scenarios going on right now, unless maybe you're on a private road, you know, in Alaska, going from in a straight line from point A to point B, which I do believe they're doing autonomous tests up there um, in those types of situations where there's nothing but, you know, deer on the road. But, you know, we are looking for a customer situation, a customer pilot to happen. And that's with our Aurora team. Torque, as you know, is not quite as open with their roadmap yet. So those opportunities are just not there yet. They are running tests, they are running freight, but they're doing that very exclusively right now with a handful of customers in parts of the country that they're not really talking about publicly. We are very confident in the leadership team of both companies. I go to the Consumer Electronics Show and I saw the Daimler people and the Wabi people sitting together in a booth having a great conversation. 
I believe they were talking about refueling and, and breakdown and those types of things. These are all problems that we need to solve together. So, you know, Covenant is not preparing to do anything in the next, you know, two years. You know, there's just nothing that's going to happen um, any sooner than that. We will pilot with somebody, which we are prepared to do as early as tomorrow or as yesterday, because those opportunities are, are available right now. But it's specific to certain lanes that we don't have a lot of activity in. So we just haven't done it yet. But it's coming in the next couple of months, I believe. I'm excited. I can't wait for you to make it public. Covenant, you're, you're leading the way there. In your opinion, what is the future of autonomy as it relates to the entire trucking industry? It's funny. You know, Grayson, I think, you know, I have a lot of conversation about innovation technology with, with people and politics and sports and a wide number of things, right? But as Americans, I think we think very binary, right? We think it's either all autonomous trucks or no autonomous trucks, or it is to talk political for a second. It's like, let's take all the guns away or let's just make rules much more stringent. Or, you know, is it no sugar in your diet or some form of a little bit of everything is okay? Like, I think we think very binary about things. And so when I talk to people about autonomy, you know, it's like, what's going to happen to all the drivers? You're trying to take the drivers? Like, no, there's still going to be plenty of opportunities for drivers. You know, right now, in the foreseeable future, I'm 53 years old. So in, before I retire, there's only going to be about three or four lanes that have autonomous traffic running in them, you know, long back and forth, east to west lanes, maybe a few north and south that are ripe for autonomy. You're probably never going to have an autonomous truck running I-80 through Wyoming and Nebraska just because of the winds and the weather and the incredible climate that is there that would make it hard enough for a real driver you know, to drive those roads, much less an autonomous truck, which is designed to mimic what a driver would do, right? Which is the ultimate safest way to drive a vehicle. So, you know, there's definitely a role for it in certain markets. And that's all I can really speak to because I hope to be climbing the next mountain or doing something before like real wide scale autonomy takes place. Maybe my son will be having a conversation with you one day and he'll be working on the space and I'll be sort of out of the industry and relying on smarter people than me to, to take us to the next step. But you lay the foundation for the industry. I got to give you a lot of credit because you're laying the foundation. You have a seat at the table. You're rolling your sleeves up. You're meeting with people. You're having really great intelligent conversations and you're pushing the envelope with bridge technologies, which I really appreciated. Matt, this has been a wonderful, insightful conversation. As we look to wrap up, what would you like our listeners to take away with them today? Well, I mean, I think I kind of already touched on one of them. And, and it's funny how our conversation has drifted from what we originally were were scripted to talk about. But um, as, as most of these great long form podcasts are, right? You know, find your favorite brand, read their ESG report, you know, learn more about sort of what goes in the way they're thinking about people, planet and the communities where they do business. You know, that's typically the three legs of an ESG report. Something else that I guess I would, you know, suggest is to sort of, Look at your own consumer activity, you know, and the role that you play. Think just, you know, talk to your boyfriend, girlfriend, spouse, roommate, and sort of talk through some of the decisions that you make um, individually or as a unit and what impact those roles play in the environment. You know, one of the things that, that my wife and I talked about recently, Grayson, was like, do we really need to have everything delivered like next day? Because Amazon, where we live, gives you an option for you know, do you want to do Amazon day on Friday? So I just placed an order for some things a little while ago. I could get it on Thursday or Friday. I know as a logistics guy, it's going to be more expensive for me to get it on Thursday in more boxes. But if I wait till Friday and they can all be aggregated into a single box one day later, I'm okay with that. Right. And in some small way, I played a positive role on, you know, the environment. So, you know, those are just some things I would leave people with. If you're interested in looking at a me and my travels, you can follow me on Instagram at Chad the Van. You can see my big giant diesel spewing sprinter van, you know, and all the adventures that I take uh, throughout the country. And, you know, you can follow Covenant Logistics on Instagram or LinkedIn. I'm very active on LinkedIn. I like to post uh, articles that, that I think are interesting. I think the most recent one was a color chart of all the different flavors of hydrogen and what's the difference between green hydrogen and purple hydrogen and gray hydrogen and you know because they're all made differently and there's carbon intensity levels that are different with each one so yeah follow me follow grayson subscribe to the podcast what else 
I love that. I would say stay informed, make choices. The future is bright, the future is autonomous, and the future is bridge technologies. Matt, thank you so much for coming on the road to autonomy today. Great. Thanks for having me, Grace, and look forward to seeing you again soon in person. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Road to Autonomy podcast. If you've enjoyed listening, please rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Want to get in touch? Follow us on Twitter at Road to Autonomy or email podcast at B-R-U-L-T-E-C-O dot com. The Road to Autonomy is produced by Brulte and Company. The views and opinions expressed on the Road to Autonomy podcast do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of Brulte and Company. The content discussed in this podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be taken as legal, tax, investment, or business advice. <laughs>